Amen. Take your Bibles, join me please. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, as we start in Ephesians chapter 6, we're looking at verse chapter 6 starting with verse 10 down through about verse 18. If you'd follow along as I read Ephesians chapter 6, reading starting about verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins skirt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. If you were with us here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the idea that we're in a spiritual battle, a battle that is within the realm around about us, but one that we cannot see. Our battle is dealing with the angelic forces that are the evil forces, the demonic forces, those who have yoked up with Satan who are attacking us. This battle is unavoidable. As the text implies, they're coming against us. We don't have to seek them out. They're coming up the hill, as I picture it, and they're trying to knock us off this spot where the Lord would have us. And we're supposed to stand, to withstand this obvious, this constant attack. We pointed out that it's against every one of us. There are some here or listening who may not know the Lord as their Savior, may not be sure that you're on your way to heaven. You're being attacked, not quite the same way, but you're under attack as well. Those of us who have already put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and asked him to be our Savior, this passage makes it clear when he talks about brethren, that you all put on the armor of God. It's all in the plural sense of all the verbs or the nouns with the idea that all of us are engaged in this conflict. It is a conflict that it is aggressive in that they're coming after us. Satan doesn't sit back and wait, but he's aggressively trying to seek those who may devour, those he may destroy. And it has serious consequences if we give in to him. We had talked about this when we illustrated here a couple weeks ago that in the terms we wrestle, it's the idea of the gladiatorial games that were fought to the death, or even when it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, that what would happen is you would strangle your opponent to win, or if you knocked them out or somehow you overcame them, the penalty for those who lost was to have their eyes plugged out so they could not see. So it's a very serious battle, a battle that is going to have dire consequences in your life. We also pointed out that in this battle, we said that we are at a great disadvantage. That's because the enemy. When he describes the enemy in the text, he describes Satan, his, fo his accomplices, that they are formidable. We are fighting and against people that are spirits that are very aggressive. Like I said, they're attacking us. We don't have to wait. They're going to come against us. They're going to try to tempt us. They're going to knock us off this mount where we're having a relationship and fellowship with the Lord. They're going to try to impede that, somehow overcome us in some type of temptations. They're many in number. He talks about, in the words that we just read, principalities. He talks about powers. He talks about those rulers, all in the sense that there's many of them. They're extremely powerful. We know from Scripture that angels have far greater abilities than we do. And these enemies that we're facing, they are really powerful. We're wimps compared to them in this battle that we have. They're powerful in that they can do miracles. We pointed out a couple weeks ago that they duplicated the miracles when, Pharaoh, when Moses was competing against Pharaoh to let the people go, that they duplicated the snakes, being, uh, the rods being turned to snakes. They duplicated the water being turned to, raw, to, uh, to blood. They duplicated the calling of the, the gathering of all the different frogs. We know that as well that they are powerful in the sense that it says in the book of Revelation that in the future, Satan will empower individuals to be able to do wonders, call fire down from heaven, do miracles, and even give life to the statue that is made in the image of Antichrist. So we're against these very powerful enemies, far more powerful than you and I in the abilities we possess. 
They're powerful enough that they can impact nature's elements. They attacked Job's family. They attacked his livelihood by bringing fire, by bringing the tornado. They can influence nations. If you go to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, you'll, talk about, you'll read where he talks about angels that are assigned to different realms. An angel assigned to Israel. An angel that's assigned to Persia. In particular, he'll talk about how they were conflicting. They were holding back the angel bringing the message to Daniel. And so we have that idea that these demonic forces can influence politics and politicians. And that doesn't... That doesn't even phase you one bit, right? You say, yeah, I can see that happening day by day. We know that they're influential where Satan is called the God of this world. Do you remember when he tempted Jesus? That Satan offered to give Jesus the lands that he was in that time in possession of all the kingdoms of the world if Jesus was bow, would just bow down to him. So at that time and part of the time now that we have that Satan still has a master hold upon all, many of the nations in the world and upon many of the peoples, the leaders of those nations. And so we know they're very powerful. We know as well that what they're able to do is to inflict people with physical illness. Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh in, in uh, Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about he was buffeted by this. Job was attacked physically with illness. We know that these demonic angels are able to occupy small spaces. They can take up just in one man's heart, one man's body. They were legion that were inside of him. They're able to give people special abilities, super abilities. They're able to give powers to an individual such as the one young girl in Acts 16 who had the power of divination, predicting the future being able to see into people's lives and to know what they were thinking or what they were after. I'm not totally sure exactly what that means, but it's that type of an idea. They were able as well to, uh, to be so powerful that when they possessed the one man, and several came, the sons of Sceva came to cast out the demon, that one man was given the ability to beat up and chase away all seven sons of Sceva who were there in the room at the same time. They were so powerful that the man that they possessed, when he was fettered with chains multiple times, he was able to break them and free himself. So they can work in just these marvelous ways, marvelous in the sense that far greater than us, not for good but for bad. So we have these enemies that are powerful, that are well organized, principalities, powers, rulers, gives the sense that they have an organization. But as well, they're experienced. Satan's been at this business of tempting people and slipping up people for hundreds and hundreds of years, all the way back to Adam. He's been, he's been tripping up individuals. He's been posing issues and temptations before them. So far more experienced than any of us and all of us in this room. So we have this idea that they're a powerful enemy, and then on top of it, they're very intelligent. When Satan is described in the book of Ezekiel, talked about even before he fell. You read in Ezekiel where he gives the idea talking about the cherub who was there in Eden who then rebelled against God. That's Satan. And when it talks about him, it makes this comment. It says, thus saith the Lord God, you seal up the sum. What's that mean? If we were to just transliterate that a little bit different, you were the signet of all perfection. You were the top of all creation. And then it goes on and describes a couple of his abilities. It says, you are full of wisdom and you are perfect in beauty. Satan's no dummy. He is highly intelligent. His IQ surpasses any of ours or probably all of ours together. He's a highly intelligent individual who comes against us with the wiles of the devil as we read in this passage. The wiles of the devil, as the children read it, they call it the willies of the devil, but the wiles of the devil is the tricks, the schemes, the crafty attacks, and oh, is he clever. With experience and with seeing what works with different people in different times, he can concoct the greatest temptations to stumble us time and time again. That's why when Paul is writing in Corinthians, he's warning the believers of that church not to become passive, not to just take a backseat role, but to beware that they're under attack. In this case, in Corinth, their attack was that they weren't forgiving of someone who had repented. And he makes the comment, he says that, lest Satan should get advantage of us, we need to be aware of his devices, how he attacks. 
And so this week and next week, I'd like to point out from multiple other passages, scriptures, some of the ways that Satan attacks and how he, he opposes God and us and what types of stumbling blocks he puts in our paths. And so just, just so you're with me, we're going to talk, before we do all the believer's armor, we're going to talk about how he attacks, when he might attack us or tempt us, you know, where these attacks might be coming from. And so we're going to look at them. And what we find is that there are some very obvious, blatant attacks that Satan makes. If we were to put some passages together, we would know that one of the ways that he attacks is he snatches away the truth. That is where Jesus is talking about how there is the one, the shore of the seed, scattering the seed of the word of God, kind of like a preacher, giving out the word of God. And within the congregation, there are different hearts. Some are like the road. Some are like the, the shoulder of the road. Some are like the ditch. And some are like the fertile field. And Jesus talks about how different hearts receive the word of God differently. Some will sit attentively. And they will learn. They might write, they might not write. But they're going to learn, they're going to take it to heart. Some, they care for a little bit. And they have good intentions, but they go out. And it doesn't last too long. Then there are some that, they just, their hearts are a little bit harder. They, they're caught up with all kinds of things. But he talks about the hard heart. The stony heart. The one that's like the pavement. That's like the macadam out front. That's the type of heart that, though it is the seed of the word of God is dispersed, Right away, the crows, the Satan, the evil one, comes and snatches it away. Takes it away so, I've, like in essence, somebody sitting and listening. All of a sudden, they discount what is said. Nah, I don't need that. That's for somebody else. I wish so-and-so were here, but I'm doing good. And so we know that one of his attacks is blinding people from the truth. The Word of God says that these things have been written unto you, that you may know that you have eternal life. And Jesus calls out, he says, everyone must be born again. And when people sit in an auditorium like this or watch on the live stream, there are some individuals who may not know for sure that they're on their way to heaven. They haven't claimed that promise that you can know. They wonder, they doubt. And when we give out the word of God, we know that Satan's at work trying to blind the eyes, snatch away the word of God from that individual and tell that individual, oh, you don't need this. You're good enough. Oh, you were baptized. Oh, you have such and such a church. And you ignore and don't take into account the words of Jesus that says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that we need to be born again. That you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That he sent his son so as to forgive you of your sins. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father but by him. But the enemy is clever. He says, you can get there through your parents. You can get there through your church. You can get there through being a good person. And he puts some other thought into their mind to keep them blinded from the truth of the glorious gospel that would set them free. My friend, don't let Satan have a victory in your mind or your heart right now. If you have yet to be born again, let this be the day of salvation in your heart and in your life. You need to call upon Christ, for he alone is the one that can save you. That is one of the more obvious ways. One of the more blatant ways that we know Satan attacks. Some of the others are occultic practices. That is the idea of getting people away from the word of God and worshiping God with some things that are prohibited. Whether it be astrology, whether it be Satan worship, whether it be seancing, whether it be communicating with dead spirits. All of those are condemned in scripture and are part of the occult movement. Is it a growing movement? Is it popular even today? Well, here in America, 1990, those who were practicing witches that were claiming to be witches, that were identifying, self-identifying, there was 8,000 of them practicing in the United States in 1990. We're just a few years away from that. But in 2008, there was 340,000 of them that were practicing, marketing their skills. The last stat that we have, in 2018, there's 1.5 million practicing in the United States. Is the occult on the rise? Then we, we read this from 2018. In a research and of a survey done of American public, do you believe, support, this idea that the astro astrological charts can benefit you? That there's something worth your reading? Even though the Word of God prohibits that type of, of practice, 29% of Americans said, 
thumbs up to it. That's nearly a third. Well, we have these stats where it's a $2 billion business in the United States just reading your future, reading your palm. It's a growing occultic movement. But then along with it, then within quote-unquote churches, false doctrines, Jesus warned us through his apostles, through others, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving, giving in to the seducing spirits, the doctrines of the devils. And then he listed what those possibilities are. As well, we read that we are warned about believing not every spirit that comes along. My friend, that includes me. Don't take something just because I said it. Examine the Word of God. The Word of God is your authority. It's your sieve through which you have to examine and you have to look and say, is he preaching truth? Go to the Word of God through the lens of Scripture, not through the lens of my church association, my church membership. Let the Word of God guide you and try the spirits because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Every spirit, and then he talks about how those who confess Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, and that was very common then. There were those who said he really didn't come in the flesh. It was just a spiritual manifestation. It's even common today. People are doubting whether Jesus has come in the flesh. The Jesus movement questions whether Jesus really died, buried and resurrected physically. There's false doctrines going on. You need to be careful. Such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In other words, there are those who are going to claim apostolic powers and abilities. In the name of Jesus, they can do all kinds of miracles. They have new insights that aren't in Scripture. They can give you new revelation. He warns us about those. He warns us about those who are coming and adding to the Word of God who are deceiving, and he says, it's no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of life. And his ministers also, they present themselves as ministers of righteousness, but they deceive. They take away from the focus of the word of God. That's blatant. We know that that happens. But then there's persecutions. Persecution is a blatant attack against Christians. This stat comes from open doors just in the last few months alone. This is what is recorded that there have been these instances of persecution. Now, mind you, if you look, this doesn't include China at all. It doesn't include Russia. They never got stats from them. So is persecution on the rise around the world? Yeah, yeah. That's a blatant attack. We understand that. We understand that he's going to do it. Do we understand that Satan's going to have blatant attacks like crime and violence? Yeah, he's a murderer. Jesus described him, John 8, that from the beginning he's a murderer. He's going to use that tool. Is there an influx of crime and criminal activity? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Who's behind some of this? Who's behind chaos and crime and so much hatred and violence? That's a blatant attack. We understand that that happens. But most of Satan's attacks aren't as blatant, aren't as repulsive. Most of the time when he's tempting people, he isn't spinning their heads and having them spew out vomit or other things as portrayed on Hollywood. He isn't having most of the time somebody, all of a sudden the high-pitched soprano is talking in this demonic deep voice. That's not the way he normally appears. He normally comes in temptation in a more, in a more effective and more appealing fashion. Remember, he's, he's a beautiful one. He transforms into the angel of light. He presents himself as something positive. And so if we want to get a clue on how he attacks us, what are some of the devices he uses against us, let's go to see what his most effective tools were to tripping up mankind at the very beginning. Go to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we'll spend the rest of our time here in Genesis chapter 3. Where we read in this text. We read, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and he said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree where I commanded you that you should not eat of it? And the man said, The woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, Why is it that you have done this? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And then the Lord goes on and deals with them. What do we learn from this text? Well, let me back up. Why do you think God put all of that detail there? Why does he bother to give us the conversation that Satan had with Eve? Any thoughts? To show us tactics. Okay. To show tactics. Yeah. Any other reason why God recorded this chapter? Can you think of any good reasons? Okay. Okay. As an example. Okay. Good. Good. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Is this an important historical event? How so? Yeah, I think, I, I think I heard it several times. Okay. It, it, obviously, this explains how sin entered the human race. Yes, no? Okay. Okay, so he's giving us details and substantiating the fact that sin entered the human race, that God did not create sin. He, God did not put sin there, but it entered in through the influence of Satan and by the choice of men. We also know this. It's showing the original readers of Genesis, which would have been the Jews, and then us following. It shows us very clearly the folly of disobeying God's words. It's a good example for us that, man, we can get into big trouble. It also shows, as you mentioned, it shows us how Satan attacks. What were the devices he used in the very beginning that were extremely effective? Effective against some really, really good people. Some people that probably stand on firmer ground than most of us. And so it's a very insightful passage. And it starts off in the very first verse describing Satan. What's the word that's, uh, that's missing here? Subtle. What's it mean to be subtle? Okay, when we go back, part of, part of the explanation we want to make sure we understand is subtle is an English translation. What was the word that was used that back then? It means to be crafty, to be clever, to be somebody who is extremely shrewd is the idea here of some creature. And by the way, think about this. Satan at this time is using the body of a serpent. That basically what we have here is Satan being a predator and he comes against Eve. And so it's giving us this idea that this creature that was very crafty, that you know, some of the issues that we don't understand is why didn't she run when she saw an animal talking? Okay? Something's different than we don't understand all the details. But he is extremely clever. And he does it in a very crafty way that, that caught her unawares or off her guard, if we can use that would be the better phrase. And so we need to be careful. Sometimes things get into our life that we don't expect. And they come in a very strange fashion and catch us unawares. There was a guy who was putting together sandwiches for his kids in London a few years back. And as he was putting together sandwiches, he put them together, got them all done, kids went to school. The next day, he was taking that same loaf of bread that he had purchased at the bakery. And when he cut into the loaf of bread the next day, he cut into it and found something unexpected in the loaf of bread. The worst part about it is the tail was already gone. It was in the pieces he had put the day before. It, but it was there. He didn't know it. And all of a sudden, it caught him unawares. Caught off guard. Well, he sued, got some money out of it. But he learned to check his bread after that. 
And I bet you go home, you're going to check your loaves too. Okay? So we look and say, Satan is very clever. And we need to be on our guard. Let me point out a couple of reasons why we better be careful. Because he attacks good, strong people like Adam and Eve. Think through Adam and Eve at the moment of the attack, of the temptation. What do we know about them? They're mature people. They aren't childish. They aren't foolish. They aren't you know, individuals that have no clue about life. They're adults. They're adults. Old enough to be able to procreate, raise kids. They're already at that point in their life with awareness and abilities. We know that they're highly intelligent people. That they're people that don't have, don't have the struggles we have with remembering and recall. That have the ability of using all of their mental capabilities. They're able to name all the animals. That's a whole lot better. I can't even remember the names of my kids. And they name the animals. They're highly intelligent individuals. They live in a perfect environment. They don't have issues like, you know, I'm just short of cash here. Or, you know, it was, it's, you know, something happened and I wasn't able to get a good night's sleep. They're in a perfect climate, a perfect environment. They're not dealing with all other types of people that are driving them nuts. Okay? They're in a perfect environment. They're individuals that have everything they need. They don't need a bank account. They don't need more. They're not running behind in their bills. They aren't trying to figure out how they're going to keep up with the taxes or with inflation. That's not an issue for them. They're individuals that have good influences around about them. They have, they have besides of the created animals, they have the Lord himself. I don't know if the angels ever were present or available, but their next door neighbor, so to speak, is God, and they walk in the garden with him. So these individuals are sinless, innocently sinless. They don't have the issues that we have. They have a clear spiritual mind. They don't have a deceptive heart, and Satan attacks them. Satan is not... He is not intimidated by these individuals that surpass us in so many ways. So I don't think, I don't think that Satan's going to be scared of us if he wasn't afraid of them. So we need to be on guard. We need to be aware that he's going to attack us. He attacks people who are much stronger and better and closer to the Lord than us, so we're going to fall prey. He's going to attack us. Something else, he attacks at the most vulnerable moment. Now, at the moment where Eve is going to, be t- going to be having her conversation, here's what we know. She's enjoying prosperity. She's got everything. Wouldn't you agree that prosperity makes us vulnerable to attack? Because most of us, the more we get, the more we want. Isn't that the way it's displayed on TV? To us who have lots of things, you won't be happy unless you get lots more things. And so we know that these people have prosperity. They have great liberties. They have far greater liberties than you and I. These are individuals that maybe they have gotten used to God. Maybe their conversations of God are not as impacting and as exhilarating as they were the day before the day before. You understand how that can happen. Some of you have have fallen into that one. That it used to be exciting praying and reading the Bible, but this past week you just let it go. You got used to God. That's a vulnerable moment now when you're not walking close to Him. And so here in this passage, He comes when she's alone. I feel for the individuals who say that in my spiritual life, I don't need anybody, I don't need the church. I don't need fellowship. I am strong enough and good enough to be all by myself. If any man thinks he stands, what does the scripture say? Take heed lest he fall. Going solo is a dangerous time. Being alone is, can be a dangerous time. So we need to be careful because of that. We need to be careful because his attacks, the very attacks are extremely subtle, very clever, how he gets people to think certain ways and pulls them down a certain path with the bait that he drags before them. And it's interesting how he does that with her, that his wiles are extreme. By the way, 
These are some of the same wiles that he uses with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. These are some of the same wiles that we are warned about, the lust of the flesh, the idea of the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's there. It's the same thing. He's using similar devices. And when he comes, watch what he works on. First of all, he creates and focuses on the desires. We know that in the whole text. Then it says in the middle of the story that when she, and this is what he's playing to, he's playing to the desires, when she saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, there you have the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, I want to be wiser. And he plays to those desires, natural desires. Nothing wrong with being hungry. Nothing wrong with that at all. But he plays with that desire and tempts her to go about satisfying that desire in an improper fashion. He plays with that desire. As we talked about it here in the Sunday school last couple of weeks, playing with sensual, sexual desires. Nothing wrong with them. But there is so much temptation to satisfy them in a wrong way. He plays with the desires for having, providing for your family. You want to provide. That's a good desire. But all of a sudden he plays with that desire that you want to be a provider and he tries to get you to provide in a dishonest way. And so he does this all the time. He plays with desires. That one speaks for itself. Let me show you something that's more subtle. He creates doubts. In this passage, he starts off the very first phrase. Did God really say? Is this really true? Is it, is it this idea? Is, can, you really, can you really trust God? Is God really reliable in what he says? And so he's going to try to get her to question a couple things. One, question what God said. Question what God, if God really cares. To say, hey God, are you, are you really giving me everything? Or are you being, are you being unfair to me? Are you being excessive in what you're prohibiting? And he is so clever in how he does this. It is amazing that what happens is you compare the verses. You have your finger in chapter 2, and you have your finger in chapter 3. In chapter 3, we read in verse 2, Eve's response, did God really say this? And she's going to say, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And she goes on, and she's going to make other comments. But just stop there. Is that what God said in chapter 2, verse 16? When God is saying commanded them, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Does this, sh does this work together? She got, God had another word in there that she doesn't quote. There's another word in the original that God has the idea, it's translated, that you may freely eat. But she doesn't quote that. She, that you can have everything to your heart's desire. She, doesn't quote, she leaves out that little bit of an expression that you can freely eat of everything in the garden. She says, God said we can eat of everything in the garden. So she's beginning to doubt God's generosity. Notice a little what happens. She says, goes on, she says, God said to us, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. What's wrong with that phrase? Go back to chapter 2, verse 16. Did God ever say that? Did he ever say you shall never touch it? No, God's not being fair. God's got too many rules for me. This, this, God, is, God is holding back and not letting me to have liberties that I think I should have. God never said that. And so he's causing doubt about God's care, about God's, God's giving a, as a parent all the opportunities. We go a little bit further, okay? And we read in the next phrase. It says, she says, you shall, uh, God, she quotes God saying, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay? How does that compare with chapter 2? Chapter 2, verse 17. If you go back to 2, 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day you shall eat thereof, you shall, what do you have? Surely die. She doesn't say it the same way. She says, lest you die. It's different words. The one is extremely, extremely pointed and, and emphatic. You shall surely die. But what she says, you might die. 
So she's beginning to doubt what God said. She's beginning to doubt what God meant or intended for them. And she's questioning. She's questioning and she's got this. And Satan's clever. He even goes a little bit further and he challenges them as saying as if God is holding something back from you. Because if you eat this, God knows that the moment you eat it, you shall, what's he say later on? He makes the comment, you shall become as gods. Your eyes will be opened and you'll know good and evil. Oh yeah, God's holding out on me. God's not letting me experience everything that I think I should experience. God doesn't really mean that I shouldn't do that. He meant you shouldn't do that, but not me. God didn't mean be sure that your sin will find you out. That he meant for somebody else, and he meant maybe it'll find you out. God didn't really say you shall obey your parents, that you may live long in the land. God didn't really mean it that way. And all of a sudden, Satan's got people doubting. And then he gives disappointments here. There's disappointments. What I mean by that is this is what he gets Eve to focus on is not all that God has given, but she focuses on the one thing she doesn't have. God's given all the trees of the garden that you can eat to your heart's content. And where does, she get her, where does he get her attention to be focused on? That which isn't accessible. Isn't that amazing how this happens? Man, I get hit with this a lot. I don't know about you. I get hit with it a lot here in the situations that all of a sudden I am I'm pumped up, I want to preach something, and then not too many people come. And I start thinking about the not too many people who didn't come, and I forget about the people who are here. We get a prayer meeting. We get a prayer meeting and 16 people come. And I get all bent out of shape in the spirit about... Oh, man, only 16 people came. But in reality, 16 people came. You know, you know how it is. Whether it be a prayer meeting or a Bible study or a fellowship time for ladies or for the seniors, it's easy for us. Teen activities, we get caught up in not who's there, but we get caught up so much with who's not there. You know how it is, families. It happens within the home. It had, we get, we as, when the kids get older and they start going away and all of a sudden the holidays come and we get all upset about the one or two that can't come and visit because they can't. They got COVID. They can't come. They ought not to come. And we get all upset about them not being there and we forget about the ones who are there. Well, we don't forget about them. We just put up with them. Okay. Oh, it happens. So he easily disappoints us. Or get us to, should I say, get us to focus on the disappointments. Oh, so subtle. Okay, okay. So what's he got Eve doing so far? Well, he's got her not being precise with God's word. He's got her minimizing God's blessings and provisions. He's got her to the point she's exaggerating his commands to make him look like he's cruel and not letting me have fun in this world. He's got her questioning whether he really cares for them, as if he's holding out on them. Oh, man, he is so subtle. And then he starts denying the word of God. He starts in by saying, you're not going to die. It's not going to happen. You shall not surely die. God didn't mean it. Hey, hey, God didn't mean husband, you love your wife. He didn't really mean that, the way it's stated, the way that you're supposed to love her as Christ loved the church. He didn't mean that. He just meant provide for her. Take care of her physically. That's all he meant. He didn't mean that you're supposed to forgive somebody completely. He just meant you don't fight with them anymore. He didn't mean that you're to abstain from all types of immorality. He just meant don't get caught. He is so clever. He is, he is so dangerous. And then he, does, he deceives. He mixes truth and error. If you look at the passage and how he does this, this is, I, I, I'm sounding like I'm giving him kudos, you know, and, and kudos, I mean, giving him the thumbs up. He is extremely clever, and I don't mean it with thumbs up, this is really good. He's evil in this sense, but so clever, 
you look at verse 5. Look at verse 5 in this temptation. And you see what he says. For God does know that in the day you, you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Is there any truth in that verse? What's the truth part? Okay, your eyes are going to be opened. Yeah, your eyes are going to be opened. And if you don't realize that when your eyes get open, you're all of a sudden going to have embarrassment and shame. You know, you're, you're going to see things different. And you're all of a sudden going to become knowledgeable of good and evil. Now, where is the error in that verse that's mixed in? You shall be as gods. You shall be as God. Your own authority. You're, you're, you'll be able to rule and to be in charge. Oh, he's so deceptive. So he attacks good people. We've got to be on, on guard. His attacks are extremely subtle. Got to be on guard. But there's a third reason we've got to be on guard. Because we're going to reap disasters if we listen to him. We're going to reap some real disasters. In this passage, you know what the disasters are. You know all the consequences. Without me relating and reading and going through chapter after chapter, immediately there was shame and guilt. That came. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how Satan doesn't portray this aspect with the temptation? He usually doesn't say, hey, listen, when, if you just get into a down-and-out fight with your family member, afterwards you're going to feel terrible. He doesn't deal with that. He just tempts you by saying, don't let them walk all over you. Let them have it. You stand up for yourself. And he presents it only in this real positive, selfish light. But he doesn't present, you're probably going to be embarrassed. You're going to regret what you said. And so there's shame, there's guilt. There is definitely death and separation. They don't die right away physically, but they do die right away spiritually. Right away, they're going to experience separation from the Father which is the spiritual death, which results in them being out of the Garden of Eden, which has been passed on to every single one of us, that we, unless we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior of our soul, we are separated from the Father. We are not a child of God until we get born again. And only when we put our faith in Jesus Christ do we become the children of God. Prior to that, we're enemies with God. We're at separation with God because all of us have been born with the one common denominator, sin nature. It's within every single one of us. Passed down, here it came because of their, what they did. The ground is cursed. You know what? Have you been working your yard this week? Yes, no? You know whose fault it is? Adam's. And I wish he would do the mowing and the weeding. But all of that, that's just there. Challenges physically, okay? What's the challenge for the ladies that all of a sudden comes out of this? Okay, your pain in childbirth shall be increased, okay? So all of a sudden, ladies, during delivery, Adam, okay? Eve, look what you did to us. Passed on, exiled from the Garden of Eden, passed on all of their children, you know how you care for your kids? All of their kids, this is what they did to their kids. They put their kids outside of that close fellowship with God unless their kids repented of their sin. It's amazing. It's amazing. And we know that the Bible is so true that by one man sin entered into the world. And by the way, we can sit here and we can say, Adam, Adam, it's all your fault. But by the way, do we choose to sin as well? Sure we do. Sure we do. Did you ever choose to disobey your parents? Did you ever choose to get angry when you shouldn't have? Have you ever chosen to use the name of the Lord in vain? Have you ever chosen to be jealous, to have an illicit thought? Have you ever chosen to disobey the speed limit? Okay, we can just go on and on and on. So we can blame him that he started it, but we've, per we've perpetuated it in our own life. And the Word of God says that the wages of our sin is separation from the Father. But this passage does two things for me. One, it tells me i got to be on guard. i got to be aware of the attacks. But the passage shows me how gracious God really is. What would you do if you had an Adam and an Eve and you took care of them, gave them everything, you warned them, you walked with them, you talked with them, and first chance they got, they went against you. 
They went against you. Yeah, we'd probably kick them out of the garden too. But God did more. And he benefited them. Without anger. Here's what the Lord did. The Lord did this good thing for them. He put them out of the garden so that they would not eat of the other tree. If they had eaten of the other tree, they would have been secured in evil forever and ever, most scholars think. That they wouldn't have had a chance to ever repent. That's why God in his grace said, I'm putting you out lest you eat of this tree. And then as a result, you permanently put yourself in a state of separation with no chance of repentance. So God in his grace helped minimize some of the consequence. God in his grace provided the proper clothing. Remember what they tried to cover themselves up? They went out and they tried to get poison ivy and put it all on. Okay, it didn't work. It didn't work. What did God provide for them? It says that God provided skins for them. That God sacrificed an animal that took the skins of that animal and covered them. What a beautiful picture of God's grace. That God covered them up when they couldn't cover themselves. That God provided that which was needed unto them that they couldn't, they couldn't make. And they tried. Just like people today, they try with religion to cover up their sin, to take care of it. And religious services become like poison ivy. They're not worth it. But God made a sacrifice from something that was innocent. God shed its blood and provided a covering for them that only God could do. A covering that we read about that in time, God, it pointed to what God was going to do for us. God had an innocent human being who had never sinned come to this world, die in our place, suffer for our sins so as to cover us with his righteousness so that when God looks upon us, God doesn't see our wickedness, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ and allows us into heaven. That's grace. That's grace that God would do that for us. But God would show his love in that while we're sinners, he died for us. Aren't you glad he did? Aren't you glad that Jesus did that for you? That Jesus provides us a covering to save us from the wrath of God. He's gracious. He is so good. How he takes something that is so worthless. Like back, years gone by in the early 50s, Harry DeLear was a man who t ran a school or worked for a school that was a girl's school, but they, in, in the course of that school, they would provide horse riding lessons for the girls in the school. And he was in charge of that. So one day he's going to an auction to see if he can get another horse or two to use. And he has his qualifications. It's going to be a horse that's going to be very gentle, et cetera, et cetera. And he gets there and all the good horses are gone. The only thing that's left because he got there late was they're auctioning off to the slaughterhouses just a, a handful of horses that nobody wanted. And he saw one of them and he thought that horse just caught his eye. He said, I'm going to buy that horse for 80 bucks. It was an old horse. It was eight years old when he bought it. And he said he could tell that it had been abused in a work fashion. Somebody worked the horse hard. But he took the horse home and he says it was just what he wanted. In fact, when he got it home in the trailer that he had, and by the time he got the horse out, it had some snow covering its back. So the kids called him Snowman. And this horse was so gentle, even with his own kids. They loved it. And so he thought, we'll work with this horse who was so good. And they did the riding lessons. And the horse just proved itself to be something that, you know, others called an old, you know, an old horse that wasn't any good. It proved so good that one of the people who had their children in his riding class, they wanted to buy it for their daughter. So they paid him more than what he paid for it. They had only lived a couple doors down in the farm area. And so they paid him two or three times wherever that he had paid for the horse. But the problem was the horse kept coming back to his farm. And there's no way it could get there, but the horse would jump over fences. Harry had never seen this horse jump. But he, you know, the other guy said, I'm not going to keep coming back for it. I'm giving you your money back. And Harry's thinking to himself, this horse is old, but maybe I can work with it a little bit. And they have local competitions. I can enter this horse into some horse contests you know, for jumping. And so he started working with it. 
And as he worked with it, he entered it into the local competition, equestrian competition for jumping, and it won. Then it won the county. Then it won the state. And in the next two years, it won the national titles. And it became one of the first horses in New York Garden and won the equestrian jumping. And this horse was eight years old already. And he went down, he got entered. I don't know why they, what, you know, you, this may not interest you, but he's in the Horses Hall of Fame for wherever that is. He was named to it. This old, beat up animal that somebody caught their, you know, caught their attention became a champion. Do you know something? That was gracious of Delayer to take this horse off the slaughterhouse. Do you know? That's just what Christ did for you. He bought you off the slaughterhouse, headed for it. He's worked with you, and as you follow Christ, you become a champion who earns crowns and rewards. And you can probably get your name into the hall of faith one of these days in heaven where you get rewarded and he says, well done thou, good and faithful servant. That's grace. That's grace that can take us who are old horse hags and God can make something out of us. That's grace. That's God. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for working with me, old and feeble and derelict of a plow horse type, and yet you can work. You've done that with so many lives here. You've made champions for Christ out of these folk, the teens, the adults, the moms, the dads, the grandparents. Thank you for being gracious to us. But help us. Help us not to fall flat on our face by giving in to Satan. Help us by grace to stay strong and true, to resist the evil one. And but Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know for sure they're on their way to heaven, help them. Help them this day to secure that. With your heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you do not know for sure you're on your way to heaven, can we give you that chance? There's people over at the side of the auditorium, the right side of the auditorium. They're propping doors open over there. And they are going to stay there while I finish praying. And if any man, woman, youngster, oldster would like to go and talk with them, they'll show you from the Bible how you can know that you're on your way to heaven. While I continue praying, feel free to get up and head over to that side and talk with one of those individuals right now. Why don't you go and make sure that you are on your way to heaven before you leave this building. Go while I pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for being gracious to us, for allowing many of us that chance to hear your word, how you kept the seed working in our hearts. Help it to continue in the days ahead. And help us by your grace to be living out Careful lives, cautious lives, trusting in you, the one who strengthens us, who helps us to defeat the wicked one. We pray in Jesus' name. Give us the victory. Amen. See you tonight.